sure. Come on. I mean, I, I remember when I was younger, uh, a friend of mine's mom was still having the same bitchy, shitty, empty conversations with her own mother when the mom was 60 and the mom was uh, – one mom was 60 and the other mom was 85. And they were still just back and forth over the same stupid shit, stuff that happened 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Like, oh my god. And I remember thinking like, Wow. You don't, uh, you know, nothing changes unless you change it. This is fundamentally true about relationships, personality to the world. Human personality, as Jung famously observed, is one of the most inert substances in the known universe. It makes a black hole look like a gypsy mop, gypsy moth aerobic dancer. <laughs> right, so your mom is still doing the same stuff and, and it's, you're not going to change, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. No, but the definitely. idea that, well, you see, it's there was this, this cult leader and now she has PTSD. Again, you're, all you're doing is taking away her responsibility. Yeah, I see that. And, and you see, when you take away people's responsibility, then you get to call not getting angry at them wisdom and maturity, which it's not. It's not. It's not. It's prudence as a child and cowardice as an adult to not get angry at those who had power over you. Right? As a child, yeah, okay, you got it. Right? They can hit you, they can beat you, they can withhold your food, they can get you put on these horrible PT, like drugs, uh, SSRIs and so on. So yeah, I mean, you don't piss off the gods when you're in prison because they can do all kinds of unholy shit to you, right? Yeah. But as an adult, to not get angry at those who've done you wrong, it gets pretty close to cowardice after a while. And I'm not, I'm not calling you a coward, I'm just saying that if the trend continues and is not examined. Because if you take away people's responsibility, then it actually becomes immature to get angry at them, right? Like if someone is genuinely, like if someone's sleepwalking and hits me, I don't press charges, right? Yeah, of course. Because they're not responsible, right? Now, if they've been sleepwalking and hitting people for five years and have never gone to see a specialist, well, okay, now we're talking. But let's say it's the very first time, right? Someone has an epileptic attack for the very first time with no history, no warning, and they punch me in the stomach, right? I'm not going to press charges because that person is it's a terrible accident. I wish them the very best, right? Yeah. You know, if, if any adult had punched me in the groin as often as my daughter's elbow seemed to have it happen from time to time. I mean, they'd be up on charges, right? So if we take away people's responsibility, then we get to reframe our anger as immaturity, which is how the cycle repeats itself. Well, I am hell-bent on Becoming a great dad, like I say, I've been going to um, parenting counseling. We've been reading books. Uh, we've been going to courses, and I just I keep coming up with this emotional issue, and I, I just that's why I wanted to call in and and have you just you know give me the straight, honest, cut through all the crap for me so I can see it, so that I can internalize the anger. All right. Well, I will tell you then that your parents were 100% responsible for what they did to you. It was not their childhoods. It was not a cult leader. It was none, no, any of that stuff. They were 100% responsible for what they did to you. And the reason that they did what they did to you was because, Trevor, they liked it. Because they liked it and because their needs come first. Because they got a rush, they got their dopamine hit, they got to exercise power, they got to exercise control, and that makes people, primitive people, feel really good. They liked it. It made them feel strong, it made them feel competent, it made them feel in control, which is what all organisms strive for, control of the moment. All organisms strive for control of the moment in the absence of self-knowledge, including human beings who are the only ones capable of self-knowledge. So they did it because they liked it. That's the only answer that you need to know. Why did they like it? Oh, who gives a shit? Yeah. 
You know, I mean, just like the the zebra running from the lion. Why why is he chasing me? No, no, just run. <laughs> the motives don't matter. What matters is your flying hooves, right? Flying hooves of safety matter. Not trying to empathize with predators, right? They did it because they liked it, because it um, was a positive emotional experience for them. That's pretty sick. It is. And I'll tell you something else that's even worse. They did it because not only did it make them feel good in the moment, but they gave excuses in the, in the aftermath, right? The great pickpocketing of the future conscience is the manufacturing of excuses. Excuses are the quicksand of the future wherein we push an endless conveyor belt of empty-faced children. I hate excuses. I hate, hate, hate excuses. They are the demon of my philosophical religion. Excuses are promises of repetition. It's all it is. Whatever you excuse, you are just putting on auto-repeat. We finally grow when we run out of excuses for ourselves and for other people. Fuck excuses. Excuses are the paralysis of the supposedly moving legs of mankind. Excuses are ways of saying, I refuse to accept responsibility. I am instead going to assign blame to factors outside myself which I cannot control, which I refuse to control. And I don't mind people who make excuses as long as they also give excuses. But your parents make excuses for their own behavior while giving no, you no excuses for your behavior as a child. It's the hypocrisy of people who make excuses that is so repulsive. And when you see somebody spouting ex- excuses, my particular instinct is to run at roughly 12 light speeds in the opposite direction. Because excuses are abuses. Excuse justifies abuse, and excuses justify and promise, guarantee, I would argue, a repetition of abuses. Whatever we excuse, we promise to reenact. And excuses are much easier in the moment. And the degree to which we allow excuses to live in the world is the degree to which we guarantee future dysfunction across the world. Right? So when you introduce your parents to me as, well, they had bad childhoods, I know what the score is. And I also know that you have the nobility of mind and heart, Trevor, to not want to give yourself excuses anymore. But if you won't take excuses, you have to find all the people in your life who exude guilty, horrible, hot, squiddy ink excuses around them and clear all that muck away and say, no, 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 my friends. You are 100% responsible for what you did. It was not the fault of a cult leader. It was not the fault of your shitty parents. It was not the fault of your genes or your stars or your history or your environment or your race or your gender or your socioeconomic class or your education or your lack of education. It was you. You made a sovereign choice to allow excuses in your life. And you got the momentary relief from painful responsibility. And you fucked yourself and everyone else for all the eternity that excuses generate in the repetition of dysfunction in the human condition. People who make excuses make problems. There are no excuses for excuses. We stand in the light of knowledge and history and philosophy, and we say, two excuses, be gone. I wish there was a way to call in an exorcist philosophy airstrike on all of the squid-like, squalling, ghostly, venom, vampiric, fog excuse capacities of the human race. Excuses are... I'm sorry I punched you. It wasn't my fault. Stand still. I want to punch you again. I'm sorry I punched you. It wasn't my fault. Stand still so I can punch you again. I'm sorry I punched you. It wasn't my fault. Stand still so I can punch you again. I'm sorry I punched you. 
it wasn't my fault. Stand still so I can punch you again. And when we get bored of that, and listen, you can literally play that for about 20 years and understand the relationship with your dad. <laughs> when we get tired of that, we grow. When we get tired of the excuses, we grow, and not until. There was no excuse for you hitting your son. You know that, right? Absolutely. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you're some irretrievably bad person. I'm not trying to tell you that. And don't you know, slide into the self-pity of self-attack. No. Because self-attack is another form of excuse, right? It's what your mom does, I assume, right? Part of the hysteria is, oh, so now I'm just a terrible person. Oh, absolutely. Self-attack is, yeah, yeah. Oh, so now I've done nothing right, blah, 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 right? Yeah. I mean, that's all horrific and, and boring stuff, too. That's stupid. And so predictable. Yeah, so self-attack is just another way of excusing yourself. And it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a ridiculous ad hominem that actually kind of becomes true in the execution. Right. Oh, so you're saying I'm you, – you're bringing up any complaints. So you're saying I'm just a basically selfish and horrible person. It's like, well, if you do this when I bring up complaints, you're certainly making the case for it, mom, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, the degree to which we do not hold human beings accountable for their goddamn actions is the degree to which we ensure that those negative actions will repeat, right? Because there are abusers and there are enablers, and anybody who accepts – or provides excuses for abusers is an enabler. So when you introduced your parents to me, who sound like they're in the top 100 shitty parents of this show, and that's not a good list to be in, with, but they had bad childhoods, but there was a cult leader, but, 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 right? No. No, no, no. No, no excuses. No excuses. No excuses. Fuck them. They took the tender heart of a young boy, and your heart is tender, and your heart is open, and your heart is admirable admirable to me. They took the tender heart of a young boy and turned it against itself, and they took the desires of a young boy and turned them into punishments. Therefore, to want is to hurt, right? To need is to bleed, right? To love is to fear. They turned all the good things in your heart against you and turned all the joys that you anticipated into fears that you knew would happen in the environment you were in. Fuck that. That is brutal. That is evil. And don't tell me about bad childhoods making bad people. Fuck that. You wouldn't be calling into this goddamn show if that was true because I had a bad enough childhood to turn me into Stalin if I needed to. Bad childhoods do not make bad people. Excuses make bad people. And do not participate in excuses. Do not support them. Do not acknowledge them. Do not respect them. Do not listen to them without opposition. Do not take out the sword of truth and cut excuses off at the knees if need be. Do not call in airstrikes of demonic shitstorms from the high vantage point of philosophical truth on excuses if need be. Do not participate in excuses. Do not give them. Excuses are the welfare state of moral philosophy. They strip from the earned what is rightfully theirs and give as disgusted roadkill plunder to those who have not earned it. No, no excuses for your parents, and no excuses for you, and no excuses for me. Yeah, that that feels right, Steph. That's what I needed. I was just full of excuses. I think I I probably still am. But no, there were survival mechanisms. Understand that you were forced to make excuses, right? Because if you don't. Give ex- yeah, if you don't give excuses to evil, evil attacks you more. So while you're still under the power of evil, you, you, you have to mouth excuses, of course. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like saying, well, I, you know, when I was in prison, I was really quite an early riser, and I liked walking around in little eight-foot circles. It's like, no, that's just the cell you were in, right? Seven o'clock, you got up, and you didn't get out of your cell, right? Yeah. So no, dad is, it's, it's perfectly he's natural. Ex- he's been full of excuses. Yeah. I mean, I remember trying to... As a kid, just crying, Dad, why won't you play with me? Why won't you come and play this game with me? And Or he'd start some project, and then he'd, he'd never finish it. And, you know, I remember we were going to build this go-kart once, and we got so far as to build a frame. He's a carpenter. He's a pretty handy guy. 
And then it was just one excuse after another why we could never finish it. And I had to internalize that. And everyone else was all, oh, you must be so sad. And I was like, no, I mean, it's okay. You know, this and this and this reason. So it's okay. So my whole life right. I've, been, I've been internalizing all of these excuses for their shitty parenting. Right. And that, but then because you haven't got a rational and, and moral and angry view of the health scene of your childhood, the hellscape of your childhood, now – You've turned your children into your parents. And this is so, so common. And, and this is why people don't understand why they get so angry at their children. They get so angry at their children because their children are like their parents. And you've already told me this to me explicitly more than once. And do you know what that is? That they want my attention all the time? No. What is it? Well, could you have any needs that contradicted your parents' needs? Oh, of course. No, of course not. Could you have any needs that contradicted your parents' needs when you were a child? Well, if I need food and shelter and and stuff. No, no, no. Uh, emotional needs. Not not the see. Food and shelter doesn't count because if 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 your parents don't meet those needs, they go to jail, which is not what your parents want, right? So they're not meeting your needs; they're meeting their needs to not go to jail, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, so you wanted to finish the go kart. Now, if you had really been demanding and and pestering and so on and insistent with your with your needs with regards to your father and your go kart, what would have happened? Uh, we it still wouldn't have got done. It would have no, just but been, what would have happened? Well, I would what would have happened emotionally? Oh, I'd be, I'd be sad. I'd be devastated. I was so excited <sighs> about that go kart. Okay, what would he have done? If, you, if let's say he made a promise, I'm sure he did at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah I promise we'll finish it, right? Yeah. And if you said, Dad, you promised. No more excuses. Get out here and help me, and be happy about it because you promised, and I trusted you. So do it. What would he have done? <sighs> Probably made more excuses. All right. And if you had been insistent? Yeah, no excuses. You promised. I don't know. I guess he might have eventually given in and said, okay, let's go do it. Absolutely not. You don't think so? No. Because if he had done that, you'd have, a, you'd have had a go-kart. That would have worked. Yeah. Right? Because if insistence had worked with your father... Then yeah, you would have been insistent because children sure. do what works, right? Yeah, kids are smart. They, yeah, they do what works. And if insist, I mean, have you, you ever seen kids try to get candy, right? <laughs> Trying to get <Yeah>. sugar, <laughs> they'll do what works. You got kids, you know what it's like. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, as I say to my daughter, hey, hey, you got your plotting face on, haven't you? <laughs> when she's asking me, when she's asking me the first of of twenty questions that's going to lead me to giving her sugar, I know. <laughs> It's a question out of nowhere, and originally I was like, oh, well, she's interested in this. How cool, right? And then after 20 <laughs> questions, I find myself stuffing a O. Henry down her throat. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, you got your potting face on, haven't you, right? <laughs> so kids do what work. And, and, and if, if nagging your dad had gotten you what you wanted, you would have nagged your dad, right? So there's a reason why you didn't, and you've already told me that reason, but – you're in double think land, so you can't get to it now, right? Help me, Steph. What Pull me out of double have, think what land. Would your dad, what would your dad have done if you had been insistent about your needs? He probably would have gotten upset. Right. And then what? And then I would get in trouble or get hit or – Get yelled at and sent away and – And I can tell you if I understand your dad correctly and you can tell – of course tell me. Don't let my theories or thoughts trump your experience. But you already told me that your dad found out what you wanted in order to hurt you with it, right? Yeah. So your dad 
if you had expressed such a hungry desire for him to finish the go-kart and how much you wanted him to finish the go-kart, I can tell you what your dad would have done the next time he was really angry at you. Said that we're not going to finish the go-kart because I did something nope. that set him off. Nope, not enough. He would have taken his boot and smashed that go-kart to pieces. Because as long as the go-kart's there, right, you can still have hope. Or he would have given the go-kart away. Or he would have done something to remove the go-kart and then say, that's what happens when you're bad. Am I right? Yeah, actually, you know what? He kind of did that. He took it out to a friend's house that had an acreage. It was, oh, well, they've got more room, so we're just going to leave it out at their place. And then that's where it started to rust and eventually ended up in the dump. Right. Yeah, but I mean, that's only because you weren't insistent, right? But if you had been insistent, then he would have gone, oh, well, that's what Trevor was really interested in. So I can really, that, that's the best way to hurt him, right? You know, a yeah. torturer does not study anatomy to make you feel better. But to find out where your nerve centers are and how you can do the most damage, the most pain with the least physical damage, right? Right. So, so for you to express needs, to express preferences is to be punished more exquisitely, right? So with your parents, you cannot express a preference with them because it makes you vulnerable to being attacked, right? To being further hurt. And now, guess what? You have children that you cannot express preferences towards, so they're kind of like your parents. Oh, wow. You're helpless now like you were helpless then, right? Yeah. Oh, geez. Still, you don't have an identity. Still, you can't have any preferences. Still, you can't will anything. Still, you're as helpless as the day you were born and the years you were raised, right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Which is why you get angry. You're not hitting your son. You're hitting your dad. Oh, man. And oh, your dad was point. not hitting you. He was hitting his dad, right? It's not the young, innocent souls that we're hitting. It's the ancient evil ones. It's got nothing to do with your son. And your frustration and your anger and your helplessness is because you're 10 again and you're locked in your room. Only now, the helpless, the people who make you feel helpless are your children rather than your parents. And you say, because I asked you, why did you have more kids? You're like, oh, man, if we'd have known, right? Like, there's no way you could have known. <laughs> you couldn't have talked to people. You couldn't have looked it up. You couldn't have asked anyone, right? Hey, what's it like with three rather than two? <laughs> oh, my God, it's so much more, right? <laughs> you were in hot pursuit of helplessness, my friend. Helplessness is what I call your Simon the Boxer, and you, if you haven't read Real-Time Relationships, you can check out that chapter. It's at freedomainradio.com slash free, but helplessness is your heroine, my friend. It's how you were raised as a kid, and it's how you perceive your life as a parent. Right? So I, I've experienced this. Everyone does. When my daughter was like a year or 18 months old or something like that, she was just – she was upset about something and she – you know, I think it was a year because she didn't really have any words yet, just a few. She was upset about something. She was screaming at me. I swear to God, she looked almost identical to my mom. Really? Oh, God, yeah. I mean who the hell screams at you but abusive parents and babies, <laughs> right?